Hey, Ahmet, you are on mute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this one should be. Okay, it, it was because of my laptop. I left. I muted it. My laptop. Okay. But that should work, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. Yeah. I just stand here. And... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, so, this was you and the uh, dissertation topic. Mining and analyzing subjective experience in user generated context, user generated content. And uh, by user generated content, we mean content, we mean platforms. Uh, so, this was an abstraction overview that I that I, uh, that I read and understand. Luchan proposed a data mining framework which can extract critical information from social media uh, platforms in terms of sentiment, opinion option, preference, intent, and expectations. And these characteristics, uh, these characteristics hold certain relationships such as sentiment, opinion, or emotion in terms of individual holding it, uh, target uh, towards it, and a set of expression, uh, expression describing. And it has a classification or assessment uh, that measures it too. And uh, the whole idea of, of uh, this uh, finding this complex relationship is from user-generated uh, text with minimum minimal human supervision involved in it. And uh, to, to further describe it, uh, uh, Luchan uh, describes subject subject to experience as a quadruple uh, of uh, H S E N C watcher. H is a holder, an individual who who holds the experiences. S is a stimulus or target. Uh, an entity event or the situation that elicits that experiences uh, is is expression uh, that describes the experience and C is the classification or assessment that categorizes or measures the experience. That is, if we talk about sentiment, then it's positive, negative. If we talk about emotion, then joy, anger, sadness. And there's a score uh, that's a score indicating the strength of the sentiment. So, so each of this. Uh, Emotion that we talk, uh, talk about in the previous slide, like sentiment, opinion, emotion, preference, uh, it it has a classification, an expression, a stimulus, and a holder. So to, to describe this uh, link uh, as as a linked information that she tries to find in her data mining framework. And this is this is one of a uh, few examples that we can see as an approach to what or what we want to see. Let's say. Uh, would like to watch the secret life of pets. I hope it's good. So type, uh, the type is the intent and there is the expectation involved in it. Uh, stimulus is uh, watching the movie that is towards it. Uh, the secret life of pets movie, it's to, expectation is towards this movie, intent is towards this movie. And the expression is would like to hope and classification and classification is optimistic or transactional. So she describes a range of this thing. Uh, among the classification or let's say how well we can consider it. So these are some examples of that. And she described uh, uh, she described uh, some challenges towards it also. She said that sometimes uh, when the sentences are contradictory, it's hard to do so. And uh, the way she solved it is, uh, is uh, trying to say that we have weak links and we have strong links among the sentences. So she had a function for that, that is detailed in her paper. I wanted, no, but she mainly she described two ideas to link to the uh, to, uh, to the type of stimulus or experiences. Uh, this uh, one is called the strong link and one is called the weak link. So and uh, and uh, whatever holds the uh, summation of those strong links and weak links, she, she gives a gives it a particular class. And she uses knowledge database, the knowledge basis also for extracting uh, concepts from it. And uh, this was her framework. As we can see, uh, there were social media platforms on top. I can, I don't know if I can zoom it in. I hope it is uh, yeah. visible to you zoom guys. Yeah. yeah. This was very comprehensive framework. Yeah. So there was some, let's say, there was some pre-processing at the first step involved. And uh, there were 
uh, language resources such as WordNet, Urban Dictionary, Lexicons. After that, uh, she wanted subjective content detection, uh, the things that we want, uh, we talked about. What, what is the time frame of this uh, work? Uh, time frame of this work, when did she did it? So, um, I think it's... Her most influential paper was 2012 ICWSM in Ireland. I still remember walking with her uh, at the you know, conference area. Um, so these are work of my PhD, and you know, I can just say that. My PhD is also scientific analysis. So yeah, but uh, I think uh, understand this. So she uh, made into the, in that paper, which I think was very influential, and we uh, nearly got a patent for it. But uh, there was a submission she made, which was withdrawn. But the patent examiner found it, so she this this allowed it. Was withdrawn patent. It's called topic specific scientific analysis. So, uh, uh, Colin Firth is, was good, but uh, whatever the name of his movie is, was so so. Mm. And uh, nobody had talked about in uh, the time when she published that there are two different objects. It is Colin Firth and the movie name, uh, King's Speech. And that there are different sentiments in both of them. Okay, and that ability, uh, she was the first that I know of in the world to talk so about that. I, I may add to you all wrong. So this this work was different than what sentimentalists we we are used to doing in classification tasks. So she she was accurately in her work at least that I saw. Uh, she was accurately predicting contradicting sentences on all those other challenges that you talk in LLM, uh, in NLP. So she tries to address that all. Okay. No, I mean, yeah. I had a paper on the you know, topic of scientific analysis on calling to implement things, uh, a similar thing. And uh, MPQA, I mean, if we talk about Jancy Weave, she is no more, you know, it's a Pittsburgh. The subject is how actually she started the MPQA data set and etc. So I'm just trying to understand the time frame. Okay. Uh, sentiment analysis was 2011 12. Yeah. Um, uh, the, her, uh, uh, one of the most cited papers is on cursing on social media. Mm -hmm. Very highly cited. It got um, coverage by all kinds of international media and and, and I think uh, was it Time Magazine or things of that nature. They, they all covered that. Uh, so very uh, and um, uh, Venbo uh, did the emotion part. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give you some significant aspect of it. First of all, Twitter is at three dimensions. Spatial temple thematic, where I, we got patent, Arthi Gomad and Meena worked on it. People content network. Um, this is the uh, area where Hemant worked on it. And sentiment, emotion, intent, or subjectivity analysis, where these two guys worked on it. Um, the framework that previous, um, uh, you know, you, you gave a very good example. Uh, good job, by the way. Um, that table, you look at the uh, richness of that. She was way, way beyond anybody, to my knowledge, in understanding all that nuances, all those uh, different you know, aspects of the language. People would do sentiment, people would, well, emotion, we are the first one, actually. I look at the emotion paper, it is very highly cited. And it was the first paper that did uh, machine training. And one neat, cute idea. We use a hashtag for emotions to collect 2.5 million uh, training sets user provided you know training so it's very high quality and that today cognovi labs is the call emotion ai company and that is it is a direct lineage of uh, of that brand. so in the in the framework we we try to learn the holder target subject experience in the classification assessment uh, in terms of uh, this five uh, attributes that I just talked about. And and then uh, after having, after uh, knowing all this, we, we can apply this uh, set to uh, broad range of applications that we see in the, in the bottom, like uh, marketing, predicting financial performance, predict, uh, predicting election results and other things. Yeah, a lot of uh, rich application. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is the whole framework. She did not implement all of that. But the yeah. previous thing she did. Um, anyway, um, so that was all for me. No, that's more than enough. Thank you. Thanks. That's exactly the right level of things. Good job. Next. Professor, may I go next? Because um, my 
I was assigned Bengal Van, whose dissertation was on automatic emotion identification from text. Um, his most cited work was what Dr. Shed just told us about how to see Twitter big data from, uh, for automatic emotion identification, for which Lou was also um, a co author. And I found um, cursing in English on Twitter to be uh, another interesting one. So, uh, According to his thesis statement, the problem identifies as follows that emotion identification is challenging because of the following reasons. Um, it's a multi class classification problem. And they claim that it involves six basic emotions. Um, I, I found this to be um, not very convincing, honestly, when I was reading. <laughs> When I was reading to so it. All the expand expand stack, right? Sorry? The expand six plus, right? Yes, I, I believe so, yeah. Um but uh, so 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 one of the problems is that um they have not stated this uh, explicitly, but I believe that emotions cannot be unilaterally classified as six or seven or n types. There are this always going to be an overlap. Um, the second problem is that manual annotation. But that is by default by Ekman's uh, uh, hypothesis that uh, multiple emotion can present. Yes, but the main classification are the six, uh, uh, the, the six emotions. Right? There are there are different classifications. There's one with twelve. Yes, yes. The, uh, that is why <laughs> while reading through this paper, I went down a rabbit hole and I found that. <laughs> A lot of cognitive scientists have tried a lot of different ways of classifying emotions, and I highly doubt that if you bring 10 cognitive scientists together, all of them will agree that this is an accurate classification of emotions. Yeah, um, the, the, the thing is that this was very much a, a, a machine learning paper, a work. Yes. And so, uh, really, he cared, we cared most about what do users say on Twitter? Right. And right. what emotions uh, show up? And uh, you know, if you have enough data, then we'll identify it. That's about it. You Nothing know, much more than that. Absolutely. I mean, the key um, solution to his problem was using the self-labeled uh, Twitter data that is available, widely available over social media, because um, they were able to uh, extract 2.5 uh, million tweets which were self-labeled with hashtags, um, right? Um, anyway, coming back to the problem, the manual annotation was another problem, and the third one was that existing um, emotions, emotion data sets were relatively small um, at that time, and this is of the time period 2012, 2016 or so, eight to ten years back from now. The solution that they have um, provided is that to address the classification problem. They investigated on lexical syntactic, knowledge base, context based um, features, um, so on and so forth. To deal with the manual annotation challenge, they went for the self labeled um, Twitter data. And to handle the domain adaptation problem, they just took blog posts from a variety of domains. Um, that being said, the good part or the smart idea that they used was they just used um, Twitter tweets that were already labeled with emotion hashtags. And um, the work was very comprehensive, in my opinion. Um, they did a fairly good job. However, uh, and uh, while watching the video, I uh, noted that Dr. Shed had made a comment that, you know, um, the statement or a tweet that a person makes over social media uh, does not explicitly always come with the personality or the individuality of the person um, just from the tweet. So that is actually a problem that Wenbo himself admitted to be, you know, considered as future work. And here are my thoughts about it. 
<laughs> the work is very comprehensive and it's good uh, given that back in 2012 we did not have the um, you know uh, deep learning and attention mechanism and all of that things that we have now um, were not there even so it was a good job uh, but my thoughts are that accurate emotion classification um, even today is a very debated and controversial topic. Uh, in fact, Dr. Shed just shared an article yesterday that language models are not able to, you know, can understand. I, can, I add to this? can I add to this? So, my PhD is a sentiment analysis. Uh -huh. I ran a workshop called Sentiment Analysis by AI in Psychology for four years. So the first iteration we ran in IBC in 2011 in Thailand. Mm -hmm. So, keynote speaker was Edward Hobby. That time he was in university, now he's in Canada. And audience, Jan C. Wave was there. I mean, who introduced the item subjectivity, Radha Mirzia, now Michigan. And uh, the Catherine Havasi, the concept had created. She was there. And uh, Professor Edward Hobby actually criticized heavily all the work. Who said this is subjective? Subjective to whom? Who said, you know, gave you this name? All. So, so our keynote talk actually hit down uh, half our workshop, a lot of debate. Because everybody wanted to, you know, mind what this is best and so on. Yeah, why do you say it's not subjective? So he said, you, it's subjective to whom? What does it Every mean? Every individual. Okay. I mean, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so, so what is the concept of model uh, mm -hmm. for sentiment or emotion? Mm -hmm. That's, I believe, still uh, still open to the yes. There is no no model everybody agrees on. Absolutely. That is, that is exactly what I also came across yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, after going through this work back in 2012, and then I looked at the work that is done in current day. There was there was a paper I found, I forgot to link the paper here, which had done a comprehensive review on emotion classification using machine learning models or computer models. And each and every model they had cited about um, over 20 different techniques, and all of them had limitations that were very valid, and all of it boiled down to the fact that. Human emotion is a very um, individual uh, characteristic, and so so here are here are my thoughts about it. Uh, not everybody is able to convey their emotions correctly through text, speech, words, or whatever, and the person who is interpreting those emotions will interpret them according to their own emotional portion, their own emotional intellect. Um, that, that was one thought. The second part does not arise here because users are self-leveling self and telling what their emotions are. That is the, that is the beauty of his data set. Mm -hmm. That it is users that, who are saying what, 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 they, what emotions goes with them. Yes. And, and I don't think I want to second guess the user, mm -hmm. uh, period. I, I know you might come with any theory you want, User has given a text and he says he's expressing this emotion. That's to me, that is a gold standard. There's nothing better you can do. You can't, okay. so like, a, you can give us best psychologists, and there is no reason why the psychologists will improve upon this. Is what user says for this. Uh, that, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm a psychologist. Sorry. Can, I, can I add this one? There is a very interesting comment. There is a sentiment analysis that was comment. Okay, mm -hmm. So, I might be a negative sentiment to me, mm -hmm. but it might be a positive sentiment to me because I'm using it. Okay. So, with that, let's stop. Okay, I, I would just say that, that most psychologists are at least somewhat skeptical about the relationship between what someone asserts mm -hmm. and what someone thinks. Right. And that is actually a substantive research problem that what that relationship is. Um, the other thing, I admire the work, I think it's an important thing, I think there's a practical perspective to impose on the appreciation of this. Having said that, from a research psychology perspective, mm -hmm. if there's this much confusion mm -hmm. around what constitutes an emotion mm -hmm. and how people perceive emotion, is this a high priority task for us to be drilling down? Because we're walking on quicksand here. We don't really know what our constructs are. Personally, I prefer to get a firm peer on something <laughs> yes. that I understand, and then I'll bootstrap my way onto something really, really hard about this problem. That'd be my um, And I have a question here to you as a psychologist or as a cognitive scientist. 
do you think that people will ever come together and agree on any classification? It, it cannot be universal in this way. When you have a lot of overlap, I saw a lot of different models that have tried to do uh, classification. But do you think you can get everybody to agree on something? I don't know, but one of the things that I did put in the lecture that I've been preparing for you guys is that this whole line of, of work on emotion is really not well integrated with the problem solving research mm -hmm. and the language understanding research that cognitive scientists pursue. That's not a, that's not a feature. That's not a good thing. It's just a fact that is sort of a separate area. Most cognitive scientists know who Ekman is, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it, it just has not really affected cognitive modeling and cognitive science, except for issues like stress and focus of attention. That's where you can okay. see something. And, and is the problem because um, we're not able to standardize this because of the human component that is involved in the uh, emotion classes, uh, emotional attention approach? I think we don't know what the basic building blocks are for yes. emotion. We don't, we don't have any constructs, that's what I would say. In, in this work, this performed really well because um, they have used self-labeled data. So whatever tweet you were able to classify, um, whatever emotion you were able to classify for that particular tweet came from the hashtag that was already present in the tweet. Point B, that if that self-label or the hashtag was missing, this would be an impeccably difficult problem to solve. And I'm, I'm sure the community would not agree to what, what I believe is. So the example that I gave, right? I'm getting married, period. No hashtag, nothing. Now for some, if a girl is, a, if, if it is coming from a girl who has been obsessed with marriage since young age, that would probably have a happy emotion to it or a positive emotion to it. But if it comes from a girl who is being forced into marriage, she would not be happy about it. So how do you classify that particular statement? You don't, you don't, you don't classify uh, it or, or you can't do it well. And, yes. and this is uh, the, the problem being uh, such that there is so much context besides the information okay. available and nobody can solve that problem. So I think it's an academic problem. You can ask, think about it. Uh, you know, but it really is not a problem solvable. Well, let me make very good. Words. So I think there's a lot of uh, we need to move on. Um, <laughs> very good, uh, very good. Uh, glad you tried to make an academic argument also. This one, uh, uh, you know, succeeded because of the self labeling. Otherwise, uh, people would not have accepted it. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. You know, and people would ask these academic questions like you are asking. Uh, but because you know, uh, the way the problem was framed. You know, um, uh, it, it just uh, uh, works. But I also uh, have uh, the 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 the, the um, sorry. Not everybody, if not everybody, every problem should be seen as a very academic problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, if you have interest, understand that um, I'm an entrepreneur too, and I saw a company, okay. yeah, yeah, and I did a company with a fairly good, uh, you know. So if you're interested. The implication of the work, go and go, go to cognovilabs.com and look at the actual applications they are doing now. Mm -hmm. The fact is that emotions are the best indicators for indicator or predictor for the uh, user actions. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can talk about other things, sentiment, blah, blah, blah. Emotions uh, appear to be the best predictor. And because of that, there are a lot of real world problems to be solved. The issue is not of understanding a singular um, a user mm -hmm. or tweet where you might have this problem. Mm -hmm. The issue is of understanding uh, among a you know a group of people you are tracking, mm -hmm. what you know community and as such right. group, uh, what you do. And for that, this works reasonably well because again, there's so much human variations. But uh, you get the larger trend uh, that you know uh, on which you can base uh, many business decisions why your drug is not being used by the users mm -hmm. and many others and um, um, one I more addition have... i will do okay. okay so i completely agree whatever process says my phd is on sentiment analysis although i published i'm our student i published i get my degree our company has with all this exactly for this debate yeah. i can talk about machine learning this and that but i was not happy with the definition so later on my journey i find our personality model Mm -hmm. I place a personal level model, but exactly what Professor said that one statement is not an identity of yours. 
look at it. Then I start talking about values model, this was not a model, yeah. and then I start going to dominate, dominate yes. values model and all those kind of things. So I, I feel little better when I look at those work of mine. Yeah. I think I mean I'm not saying those are the you know, great book. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, after going through this, after these problems coming to my mind, one half big obvious solution that came to me is that if you want to identify the emotion, you need to look at the person who is saying the statement. So basically, what I'm saying is um, beyond that <coughs> statement or that tweet itself, you need the metadata that talks about the individual. And I, I'm sure there is a lot of work already done on this that gives you the user information and that would be much more um, concrete in being able to identify the patient. Let me follow up on that. There oh, are too oh. many parameters. I'm not ever going to be able to model them Let's go. with all of these parameters. But the other thing that I want to emphasize is exactly what Amit said. Spot on in my opinion. What is it about language that predicts behavior. This is something that psychologists <laughs> have not focused on sufficiently, in my opinion. They've focused on language and thought, but not language and behavior. And that is a theme that I think the group could. <laughs> sure, of course. It's not a wonderful um, thing. Normally, I would encourage a lot of discussions on this. <laughs> I'm very happy both of you guys got really into your subjects and, uh, you know, uh, got uh, quite, uh, you know, deep into those. So wonderful. Next question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm worried I'll have to do entire another class for the <laughs> winters. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I am going to cover Delroy Cameron's thesis. Uh, uh, this was work published in 2015. Uh, so the main idea is that uh, you want to uh, process some information, uh, process it for what? You want to process it for meaningful uh, scientific discovery. So the, uh, meaningful scientific discovery means that you have a lot of uh, uh, academic abstracts say from PubMed or something like that. And you want to discover information that you didn't already know before through uh, uh, making uh, connections to scientific knowledge that you have at your uh, disposal. <clears throat> so now uh, the first thing is before, I like to think of the inputs and outputs first. So maybe that's a little bit of a spoiler. So the, the here is an example output. Um, you, you have dietary fish oil, and then the, the typical thing that happens with dietary fish oil is that it stimulates a particular treatment for this syndrome, Raynaud syndrome, for example. So nobody would uh, naturally think to predict a adverse effect of something that actually promotes treatment for a disease, right? Uh, so here you can see uh, adverse effect for that disease, even though dietary fish oil actually uh, promotes treatment for Raynaud's syndrome, but here directly it shows that it disrupts something that can cause Raynaud's syndrome. So these are uh, this should be quite a shocking discovery at the time that it was made. Um, how did they, how did the, uh, Delroy make that discovery? So. You see here the link that was the consensus that it stimulates a treatment to the disease. But then there's all these other things that it, it can be converted to uh, prostaglandin, uh, which can disrupt platelet aggregation and then cause the disease. <coughs> so how do you figure out something like this? So what are the technical challenges with figuring out something like this? Technical challenge number one is that the subgraph connected to dietary fish oil is probably gigantic. And then if you keep going down the is a rabbit hole, you don't know where to stop, right? Um, so then uh, basically then what is the term uh, to describe the correct or uh, subgraph context? Uh, let's call that uh, uh, semantics, right? So meaning, uh, 
uh, you want to really describe a subgraph that in essence captures the meaning of uh, something, so a, a scientific concept. So here the scientific concept is that the fish oil either causes, treats, or something uh, does something to the disease, right? So <clears throat> uh, before this work was done, what was the goal of information processing systems? Um, you get a series of observations, and then uh, the machine does not reason about those series of observations. The machine provides those series of observations to a scientist who has some theories about it. They use those theories to reason and uh, provide alternative explanations for the, the observation. Uh, the reason for that is that a human is better at understanding the context. Uh, again, I chose this example. Actually, he chose this example because it's unique that without a human, it's very difficult to predict something that's against the trend. Treatment has become cause, right? So, uh, <coughs> The automation procedure for this is uh, very unique. <laughs> so first, um, the main idea is the precise definition of context, which is a distribution over semantic descriptors associated with all semantic links. So what is a semantic link? You start at your source object here, dietary fish oil, and at a schema level, you go up to two or three hops. So what do I mean by schema level? For example, the maximum length path in this graph is more than two, more than three. Uh, but uh, if you see the number of relationships on any given path, it is two or three. If you think of any the number of types in any given path, it's also two or three. So the uh, heuristic for what defines context seems to be uh, the type and relationship information where to cut off the graph, not the instance level path length. So I, I uh, found this uh, very insightful because nowadays in graph embedding techniques, for example, nobody looks at the schema, but they cut it off at two and three hops. And uh, that probably is a terrible way to do it now that I think about it. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, what has changed between this 2015 and now is that uh, people are saying that these semantic descriptors that uh, was mentioned in Delroy's work is now, um, say, embedding vectors. So what is the uh, semantics of an object? It is all contained in an embedding vector. Uh, but this is not true. So a semantic descriptor as defined in Delroy's work was a mesh hierarchy, which is the mesh, mesh hierarchy. Uh, which is goes um, uh, at the schema level and defines the hierarchy of concepts surrounding a particular, right? So until we can convincingly prove that uh, contextualized embeddings capture schema level information, they are not the same thing in terms of the semantics that they define. Okay, that's a very good point. So, I mean, uh, connecting to Joy's work. So uh, we, I mean, uh, we didn't prove, we empirically tested. Uh, which graph embedding algorithm retain the graph structure versus which graph embedding actually do the information uh, restoration better, can, can store it better. So now, if schema is a third point, we can also evaluate that. It would be a nice point. Exactly. So that's what I put here in the end. I, so I want... It's a very powerful thing, and that is not a being experienced. <coughs> and that will make a huge difference. And it's very well understood conceptually why it should be done. Sure, we should, we should do that. Right, so and I was... By the way, what uh, <coughs> uh, 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 Pratik Jain did, you know, uh, the, the, he said that instance level, I don't have enough uh, knowledge for alignment. I'm going to enrich the schema and use it for aligning mm -hmm. instance level. That is the 10 year, you know, award paper. All oh, right. right. Maybe I don't know enough, but doesn't schema already have the structural information in it? Yeah, it's yeah. Enough, but how to get it is the That is one. Yeah. Schema is structure information, right? Schema is structure information. Um, another point. Uh, so what Doctor Das was saying, I also had the same idea that why don't we try graph neural networks by looking at schema level information? In fact, I was meaning to talk to him later about it, but we will do that yeah. another time. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
So uh, another thing that uh, Delroy mentioned that I'll say before we finish is that uh, in the contextualized embeddings that you have uh, today, there is one piece of information that is useful for sure, which is that if you see that dietary fish oil is not convincingly uh, explaining Raynaud syndrome, uh, given your series of observations. What do I mean by that? Your knowledge says that dietary fish oil should be treating Raynaud syndrome, but your observations are, show, are showing that it is somehow causes Raynaud syndrome. What statistical uh, techniques of today can tell you is that something is missing. So Delroy mentions okay. this, something is missing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so Delroy mentioned this saying that uh, the statistical uh, techniques that he tried, he tried a lot of them, can allude to something being missing. But what happens if you rely purely on statistical techniques is that whatever is missing, if you have enough parameters, it will uh, correlate with something spurious. Yes. 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 Yeah. So uh, that's just wanted to point that out. Uh, <clears throat> right. So uh, that that's it. That is the yeah. one bit. Some. Fantastic. Uh, I want you to understand. <laughs> You see, um, <coughs> the knowledge that is useful to humans comes in a much richer form. To me, if you need something which takes some subset of this, it would be of no use. In the end, I'm interested in uh, etiology, I'm interested in how, uh, you know, um, the biological process or uh, you know, where um, something that you eat or, you know, uh, that leads to some disease, is that level of things that ultimately matters. That's what you decide on. That's what you act upon. So the richness of info knowledge that you need to extract and you need to deal with is far more, uh, you know, richer. Uh, it, it, the knowledge that you need to deal with is richer like the subgraph, and when you find something simple, like you can classify, you learn very little about that thing. When you or when you find something, so so think about what does your AI method box and gives you. Here, I find the word that allow gives you actionable information is uh, appealing, and that I would uh, assert that it comes in a far richer form. I cannot express this as triple. Okay, this whole thing is meaningful. And that is the knowledge that you are interested in when you are doing all scientific experiments. This is what you're interested in, not some little parts thereof that when you increase that, that increases that is not all that valuable. Okay, and that is a fundamentally different kind of research. And this is the research that matters, not the other things in my view. But just you can publish papers and all that, fine, you know, found some patterns. But so it's very, very important to understand this kind of thing. And to me, this thing is very unique that you are extracting from scientific literature this knowledge graph. <coughs> this kind of knowledge graph was manually created. So different parts of this come from different documents, different papers in, 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 in PubMed. And uh, there is a guy, uh, what is his name? Um, you saw the name, I forget, the University of Illinois guy, who did this, uh, undis it's called Undiscovered Public Knowledge. He, he made 11 such discoveries. This was one of them. And the Roy, what the Roy charter was to prove that there is a uh, <clears throat> uh, technique available uh, that, that we can do this automatically. That uh, what is undiscovered public knowledge, which is a extraction of such a com complex knowledge, <clears throat> can be done uh, algorithmically. That was the big promise. And for that, I think it very much stood out. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, too few of the AI people understand these kind of issues. I have a follow up question, Kosh. Yeah, so uh, subgraph identification is a, is a very valid and you know, necessary problem within knowledge graph. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, I mean, I did my search and whatever it is. And I believe what people are doing now, we are, you know, the nice direction of you know, applying community detection on knowledge graph and so on. So, yeah, I mean, if I want to take a summary, you know, out of this, uh, you know, dissertation, I mean, and you are also working. So, for the subgraph detection, what are the major uh, families of work? I mean, let's say technique kind, uh, family technique of one, family technique two, and so on. So, what are the subgraph detection techniques you can use so far? It's a very important problem. You, uh, yeah, I'm you asking you. I mean, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Can you can you probably very broad level give some pointers? Uh, so uh, at least for knowledge graphs in the papers that I've read, uh -huh. the subgraph is determined heuristically, one or two hops, mm -hmm. or two or three hops, mm -hmm. not one hop usually. And then no, uh, there is no heuristic. I mean, it's just two or three hops, right? No heuristic you are applying. You are applying. You know, you are getting two hops. You all all the right? Yeah, but before that, they do a pre process to determine two or three hops. That's why I'm calling it two. Okay, so they yeah. have some, you know, predecessor and a model which tells them how many hops to pick up. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do they do that? It precisely, is that say they pick two hops, hmm. then they predict some links. Hmm. If say they pick three hops, they predict other some links hmm. on a small graph, and then they pick which one is better and expand that to the whole graph. So that is what I mean by. Oh, okay. yeah. how, how do they decide which one is better? Link prediction actually on a small graph. I extrapolate it to the entire graph. That is how they do it. Who is next? And uh, the other thing that I, they actually just consider the whole graph as context, but then decay the aggregation weight. As you go That's farther away from huge computing power, in the yeah, yeah, hyperbolic embedding, what mm. they call that, that technique. I just have a pretty basic question related to Kosick's presentation. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. Why do you think there hasn't been a lot of uh, advancement in that particular area of field? Is it because schema itself doesn't contain a lot of uh, semantic information? No, that's not the question. The question is, <laughs> see, if I look to them in literature, there might be 10 different graph embedding algorithms available, including recent edition graph embedding. Now, how do I know when I'm actually trying to think? Probably, probably they also asked this question several times in different ways. How do I know what I'm getting as a vector is retaining my information? There is no check on that. I mean, let's say you can come out with a different. I doubt it does. And you need to start incorporating schema information and richness of what perceptual models before you get there. Yes. So basically, there is no empirical proof that it, it does. But exactly, who is not 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 trying to prove that empirically. So it means this is something. Uh, uh, this is just last statement because in my work with the Dr. Gusneli, where we use Prolog. There is a, something called as a bias file. Mm -hmm. So bias file is essentially the schema of whatever we write in the back. Right. So, Dr. Das, I did some minor experiments. Huh. Huh. One, one was that uh, uh, I asked Chat GPT, huh. GPT two huh. actually, if birds can fly, right? Hmm. And then I said, uh, um, consider that a uh, raven cannot fly. Okay. What kind of bird? Raven. Okay. And then I asked it, is raven a bird? It said yes. Mm. Can all birds fly? Then if you ask it, it says 
Yes, still, even though it agreed to Raven not flying, right? So, and Raven, so uh, my hunch is that, uh, like Vedant was saying, right, in symbolic programming, you can provide biases mm -hmm. at a set theoretic level, like mm -hmm. it's an instance of the set changes that the set changes. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with a language model. Right? That's, mm -hmm. I think, what is missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, uh, uh, so incorporating this set, uh, you know, notion and, and the constraints with that, that's a very valuable thing. If you if you figure that out, that would be very useful. Okay. So let me just add to that. Indeed. So that's a problem. And there's a way, you know, science goes, right? You do some advancement, then you find out there's a problem, and then you solve the problem and you know, go on. So uh, if you see language model has biases earlier, there are a lot of work on devices. And for exactly this problem, there are a recent paper came out from uh, RHFL is a, is a new mm -hmm. thing. We are talking about now, and that uh, able to deal this kind of problem to a certain extent. I'm not saying it's completely solved problem, but obviously that's the way science is, right? You make progress and you know, go up and go up. Mm -hmm. so, yes, there are such discussion already there. Okay, let's go. The problem we are facing is. Uh, so suppose we have a query now, who is not to the query, and then we can represent uh, the query in this way. But then uh, the problem we're facing is this guy has very multiple types. So what, what, for which type do you want to be very Then, uh, then claim that the context of every type of order for just to be provided to enable both executors and machines to validate and assess the reliability of the knowledge before you need. Okay, that um, when we're talking about a wide robot, you know, we need to know what context uh, that this, this person should be involved in. And those contexts uh, you know, include where. Um, where is this fact from? And we can, what kind of website do I get this fact from? When was it created? Who created this fact? Then, uh, for some core information, when did this event occur? Spatial uh, information, where did this uh, event occur? And then, certainty, what is the confidence that we say this event happened? Then, this idea was to uh, her, her, uh, Invention was something called cumulative property. It can be built as instances of generic property whose extensions contain a set of integer pairs. Uh, to put it simple, suppose uh, there is a category called Hopkins White, and then I name one of the ladies as a white one, and then I search for every information uh, about this lady and I label them. What we are getting is a triple popular marriage. Uh, this way. Then the context of the single result is uh, where, when, uh, entities and uh, certainty. This is uh, this means that we have context contextualized this uh, particular person or uh, entity we would like to infer. <laughs> and then there are some uh, other technical issues regarding to the specific system. Uh, are you creating a metadata pattern? Yeah. yeah. And that's precise, actually, that one. There are uh, ways that she invented uh, to help with the fast uh, adaptation to her new system, as well as uh, to make the entire uh, process precise and efficient. That would be it. She addressed both the representation, storage, and computation of um, uh, this more complex, uh, uh, you know, information that has provenance. Um, and uh, so it was, yeah, it was it was a modeling issue. It was uh, then storage and efficient processing. All of them she addressed. Them. Um, one thing that you, uh, you know, again, you could need pay attention to and just step back you can notice is that. All these rules, so you see that the problem definition is fairly rich. And um, you'll find thousand papers on uh, Sparkle and uh, sorry, on RDF and all that kind of stuff. 
but you find hardly any paper on uh, you know uh, something that would have contextual information with it the fact is just with a simple query you realize that these are absolutely real world important problems right you want to ask a simple question like um, when this person is married to this person and it's married three times at different periods of time all the investment you made in uh, creating all the thing in uh, rdf sparkle is useless you can't answer that question right and here is a you know what where it is making it possible for you to address some real problems that are why and so what what amazes me is that in so much of the literature that's published they are simply uh, making the problem simplified and academic and are really not solving real world problem you look at every paper discussed every dissertation discussed today and you will see there is a uh, i think probably barring um, a ben book but you look at Lou and the comprehensive aspects of you know understanding um, uh, a post or language, or you look at the Roy and you know the you know that you know the knowledge the useful biology is this complex. All you all look at, in all 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 test, uh, uh, they found some real problem to be solved and then work towards solving them. Okay, okay next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you yeah, yeah, sure. Should I? Uh, so today we'll be uh, talking about uh, Bowman's uh, dissertation, uh, and his dissertation is titled "Personalized and Adaptive Semantic uh, Filtering of Social." For social media, and looking at the thesis statement, I think it's a very well-crafted thesis statement uh, to build an effective information filtering system. Uh, background knowledge and semantic web technologies can be used to address lack of context, dynamic changing vocabulary, and scalability challenges introduced by social media's short text and real-time nature. So here, by social media, he's referring to only Twitter. And these are the three things uh, that he, uh, the three problems that he identifies are lack of context, dynamic change in vocabulary, and scalability. And he motivates with uh, good examples as to why these are the, this is the case, with especially tweets. So, what is personalized here? Uh, what I mean, if I log into my Twitter ID, right. what I will see? That's, that's mm -hmm. the problem. So, uh, that is uh, in my discussion. That is my second point uh, because. That was what is it not filter bubble problem? I thought it was a filtering problem because uh, at no point, either in the dissertation, the complete dissertation, or in the talk, uh, he talks about uh, what is being personalized. But based on what, based on the complete talk, I think based on the tweets that we are. Oh, so my question, you can answer giving me. So you don't know filter bubble, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so any pointer towards that when you are presenting would be sure. And uh, right, so these are the three problems as I mentioned, uh, and I think most of us are aware of what these three problems mean. Uh, lack of context is especially due to the short format of the tweet itself. The dynamic changing vocabulary is, uh, let's say, uh, during an event uh, such as a hurricane hitting a particular state, the usage changes over time. Initially, it is. Uh, maybe uh, just information uh, like the hurricane is going to hit the place and after that there is a destruction phase where people want help so the hashtags are now changed and that is the dynamic change in vocabulary that he's uh, talking about and scalability is uh, almost around uh, 500,000 tweets are being uh, during the time of his talk I think around 500,000 tweets are being made in a single day. So scalability is also a very serious challenge that he needs to address if he wants to filter through these many number of tweets. And uh, how he is using background knowledge and semantic work.
be uh, because of the type of but disconnected that's yeah. what they Krishna, I had a question. Um, okay. this I, I hope you can hear. I have a small question. This user evaluation, what were the kind of evaluation metrics that were used to um, evaluate the... Trees of relevance to you. Sorry? Trees of relevance to you. So uh, imagine a software sitting, agent sitting there, constantly monitoring the tweets that you're making. Mm -hmm. It builds a knowledge graph of your interest. Mm -hmm. And that knowledge graph can be used to filter the tweets of your interest. Uh, but it says that... Uh, the users were evaluating the knowledge graph that was built. So my right. question is, how were you evaluating? Yeah, I, I can uh, answer that particular issue. So he manually created. Uh, for a second, I mean, we can we can remove that. Yeah. If we look in this particular image, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So each tweet has a set of entities that are uh, being recognized, right? And then he is using his uh, hierarchical graph that he has built in order to abstract it to another concept. Mm -hmm. So he gives uh, in the evaluation, he gives the tweet, the entities, along with the concept that he's uh, like his model is abstracting to, mm -hmm. along with uh, the Wikipedia links for all the entities. So a person is uh, made to answer S or not, is what I'm, and maybe he has three uh, different uh, branching factors. Yes, no, maybe. Uh, and a person needs to classify whether the model was predicting correctly. Like, so or, basically you answer yes, no, maybe about whether the abstraction, abstract concept ab that you're Abstraction concept is relevant to the entities that are present. Uh, that was the evaluation being done. Um, and the uh, knowledge graph, personalized knowledge graph was built not just using the uh, statistical analysis of the tweets, but also using the background knowledge of Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So that you had your you know, entities and uh, you know the other things and uh, organization in the knowledge graph, not a not a um, statistical model. Right, and how this dynamic changing vocabulary challenge is like implemented using the knowledge yeah. So oh, for that knowledge graph is not being used. Okay, uh, only knowledge graph, uh, the background knowledge is being used uh, to address the lack of context issue and dynamic changing vocabulary is just being tackled with a uh, code that calculates the co-occurrence of two different hashtags occurring. No, he did address, address the issue that user interest changes. So the <coughs> yeah, user interest change over time. There's a knowledge graph and that's continues. The, um, the personalized voice graph can be continuously modified, right? Right. It's not a, a one-time training like the new CCP model. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, you know, creating this, uh, you look at just again, uh, much of the model, uh, many Many uh, so called powerful uh, systems are unable to deal with the continuous changes in the world around you. And, uh, you know, I mean, they get trained and they use massive amount of data to get trained once, but they can't keep up with the. Suppose uh, a fact was so, uh, you go back to example I have given in Bali. Uh, Hillary Clinton was the first lady on um, 1997. But she was not the first lady in 2001. For my system um, to understand that and um, honor that was much easier. Talk about other alternatives um, and for them to know specifically that uh, Hillary Clinton is now no longer first lady because there was an election and the change of president. Uh, you know, your status, your data driven systems just can't do it. Just can't do it. And in the world, this is such an important thing. So many of your user needs, you know, expect that, uh, you know, system is up to date. Right? So, um, I, I, I wonder why People are so impressed with the current state of the art when they can't do this simple thing. Very important thing, not just simple, but very important thing for many problems. 
Then we talked about recency issue in on the pizza. Uh, <clears throat> but Google is able to give us answers based on uh, some retrieval using a language model, right? Talks. Yes, uh, Google is able to give you answers um, in the sense that it has the mechanism to continuously index new pages, but it has zero understanding. And hence, uh, it will give you the answer, uh, rank the answer. Uh, you know, uh, and in the ranking, it will use the, the uh, more recent document and earlier, and hence, you have a feeling that you, you feel that Google is doing a good job. And it is indeed doing a good job in the fact that, in the sense that it is actually indexing, incrementally indexing, its, it's index system is incremental. Doesn't require the full training. That's uh, that's the Google's uh, you know positive thing about Google, but it has no understanding other than the heuristic that I will probe that uh, language uh, earlier on. The other thing is I did not understand your point about this uh, uh, hop. I want you to understand very important the distinction between all the <clears throat> data mining approaches and clustering, and the approaches uh, that are. <clears throat> machine learning and such, and the approaches that involve use of explicit knowledge. They really, in my view, they really belong to different category and they really have, um, the, 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 in general, those IR algorithms are the weakest. And then this and then that. There is also, you know, some, um, uh, it depends also on problem, you have to understand the problem. But the knowledge that is represented in ranking is a small subset of knowledge that is represented in the hierarchy graph, right? Richness. So that's the answer. Simple. No, no, I get regarding the knowledge point, Dr. Shed, but uh, in this work, Pavan uses uh, an activation function to essay scores to each uh, of the concepts that is present in the knowledge graph. So top K hits, uh, I think, makes sense here, uh, especially when we want to look at uh, how he is coming to baseball as the only concept that is available. There might be other equally probable concepts right behind it. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm guessing there's a problem of not taking the reach in a problem to show you the value as opposed to, uh, you know, the actual set of the approach. So uh, you take a problem that is, Apparently, it's solvable by ranking. Uh, you know, uh, then then you are going to show the results. You know, the importance to that. So it's it's, it's an artifact of um, selecting the right uh, evaluation uh, and thing. But in generally, the approach is more richness than I think. Uh, problem on which you are shown the you know saying oh this is what uh, what is your initial kind of activation function. Uh, he used actually multiple activation functions uh, based on. Uh, so uh, he says there are around uh, nine hops uh, to consider, uh, and the most information is captured between five to nine hops. Uh, so he uses different activation, a log probability activation function, and so on for uh, like one to five. Nine hops in the Twitter network or in the knowledge graph? In the knowledge graph. Oh, okay. Uh, so one to five, he uses a log probability, I guess, and after that, he uses different uh, activation functions for five to nine, ten, nine to eleven. Why is log probability is every activation function, right? I mean, like which? No, I can just do that. Anyway, we can discuss that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next, we have one more at least. I can. No. Uh, my top just like uh, I got Sudan Taraz so that thesis was knowledge driven implicit information ex extraction and he worked basically on three main problems uh, one was in clinical clinical ordered narratives other was in Twitter and one was cl clinical narratives one was <clears> structure <throat> and other was not structure so why we need information extraction. So expressing ideas 
like which is our day to day communication people are not able to express ideas so now it is larger so there is often been a miscommunication in expressing ideas now from from that miscommunication if we want to ex, uh, want to get the implicit knowledge implicit knowledge that is being are uh, not is in the direct context of the knowledge provided so if you want to get that knowledge so it is we, we will not able to get that knowledge if it is uh, been misinterpreted or miscommunicated so his idea was to extract the implicit knowledge from uh, in the in these three uh, domains and use that knowledge uh, for classifying those te text and uh, narratives to find out which kind of disorder it is or which kind of fluid it is so now uh, how he did extracted like what is this implicit factual information now you see there are four examples and in these examples uh, in the first example it said it's hard for me to imagine movie stars as astronauts but the movie looks great and who doesn't like sandra so now we don't know here that which movie is they are talking about So if we go into the knowledge base and we try to look up into, and if we Google the uh, Google this, and it will say us that this is gravity. But at the time we in like in 2016, it was an advanced work to work on implicit knowledge because previously there was. I have a, I have a question. So is this the only sentence in the process, or we have a discourse to process? So they have like tweets. Okay. So do do I, do I have the previous tweets? Or is, this is a conversation, right? Or this is not a conversation? Yeah, this is a like this is an example from a tweet conversation tweet. Hmm. So they like this this was in his thesis. So I took an example from. I, I believe I read this one. So I had a question that time when I was in India. So during the party, the professor mentioned about. So I had the same question when I asked that time. So see. What you were mentioning is an anaphora problem. You have uh, a you know, pronoun, and you are trying to finding out what is it mean. Then you go back to you know, this course and try to find out anaphora. So uh, I I was you know very you know uh, I I mean I mean I struggled to understand how this problem is you know different than anaphora catapora. What people have been discussing. When is where are you going to find in Enough for a problem solving. The fact that uh, here is a uh, movie gravity that is the solution. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know the data. So basically, if I let's say I I look at the uh, biography of Einstein in Wikipedia. So first paragraph talk about Einstein. Then all others he 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 and he man etc. So then finding out all these pronoun elliptic and find out this is Einstein is the enough for a problem. So I believe this is also a wonderful. The, the big distinction here is that he could solve this problem because he is using knowledge base. Hmm. He tried to solve the problem without external. The knowledge. problem is enough for a problem. Huh? The problem is enough for a problem. In some cases it could be, but not always. Where? where how is that? I'm, I stepped up. Uh, yeah, so the so first sentence says it's hard for me. Uh, blah blah. And but so you me, think the it is tamu tamu bi tamu bi. Some, oh, no, no. So, so, okay. so basically, let me tell you. Like, uh, okay. so the problem is, uh, so here in, uh, so in the in the let's say medical documents, okay. right? So, so sometimes physicians are mentioning like, okay, patient has uh, difficulty in breathing, or, or or something related to like shortness of breath, mm -hmm. but they are not specifically mentioning the shortness of breath as an entity uh, in the documentation. Okay. So here, I think he, uh, he was trying to solve this problem to by getting the definition uh, from the UMLS database. Uh, no, no, technically I understand. Knowledge of mind. My, my, the basic question is how this is different than problem definition of anaphora or catapora. So that that part I must tell. So in actually anaphora, hmm. the gravity should be mentioned somewhere. Yes, in the discourse. But happening. here, the actual entity is not mentioned. Right. Okay, right. It's missing. Right. Yes. Oh. And from the definition, from the different terminologies, uh, and using the knowledge graph, uh, they are like uh, linking different words and then uh, getting the actual entity. 
Okay. So, is a missing entity and we are trying yes. to... Yes. Okay. Implicit knowledge is that which uh, we don't know, but we get it from the whole understanding which we can define using the knowledge basis. Mm -hmm. So, this was the one example, like these, this was the one example of the tweet and the movie system. And the other example is uh, the shortness of bread and edema, which Raksha discussed just. So, I can explain that. I have a question, Deepa. Yeah, come in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, did he do the work on Twitter data or on clinical data? Both. Both parallelly. So, he has two, two mostly cited papers. Hmm. One was in uh, the clinical domain, other was in the Twitter domain. So, in clinical domain, uh, what they did is that they took the narratives from the doctors hmm. and they defined uh, like whatever their notes was. Like doctors have notes. Mm -hmm. Like if you go and visit doctor, mm -hmm. then they will write some notes for you that you are suffering from this. Mm -hmm. Or if if there is no direct entity, like a shortness of breath, so they will <coughs> explicitly not say that, but it will implicitly extract that information using the knowledge base. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea. Here. So but, a fluid accumulation in um, upper left lung. Mm -hmm. What is what it is? It is edema. Okay. The medical term is edema. Okay. If, how if do you, you see the definition of edema, then this type of terminology is. Uh, oh, okay. So how do you understand that physicians has meant edema without um, <clears throat> semantically mapping fluid retention in part of the body mm -hmm. to edema? You will not be able to code text right you would not be able to <clears throat> the uh, the human reading it probably understands it yeah but you will not be able to uh, code it for medical uh, you know coding purpose you will not be able to compare that with other way doctor describe the same condition mm -hmm. with other text mm -hmm. and hence that would not be there yeah of course i understand so that, that yeah you you would need to look up for that in a knowledge base um, i asked this question because <clears throat> clinical narratives would be um let me put it very simply, would be longer texts of document, whereas tweets are going to be very short. So why, um, I mean, how, how is he parallelizing both of these? No, these are two different applications, like two, two different worlds. But using the same techniques uh, for no, both? No, 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 he changed a little bit so far to Twitter. Twitter. No, so, so it's a knowledge gap different, right? So length of text doesn't matter. I mean, I mean, it's not using any statistical system. The length of text may matter. It's a, it's a knowledge general system. So they have a very, you know, defined graph, mm -hmm. and they are going there and you know, the, so, there. so these, so these graphs, they call it n grams. So these, these are uh, like developing their knowledge from the knowledge bases. Mm -hmm. So there are different knowledge bases they used. Uh, he used in his dissertation, like. Uh, uh, this was the example I was explaining, but I will come to this one later. So he was using WordNet for the quiz and DBDD or any other knowledge base. And then for uh, this clinical system, he was using this cakes. No, so CTX was the parser uh, uh, that was a state of the art parser at that time, created by Mayo Clinic. And actually, uh, many students, by the way, he was the first uh, intern with uh, EZDI. I think it was first, but uh, Shreyas was an intern, several other people were interns. And, uh, so there is a, many of our students have, have been, you know, this kind of real world problems are found because of, again, this kind of engagement. Uh, but yeah, this, this thing was explaining the idea that uh, the things which are highlighted in green, it's named entity recognition, then things are in yellow, it's relationship extraction, then entity linking. Till this point, the work has been already been done till 2013. So from 2013 to 2016, he did work on implicit information extraction, which was in advanced work at that time. In implicit information detection, like <laughs> there is an example which is highlighted in red, like comfortable breathing in room air. So this is a definition from the knowledge base that this is no shortness of breath. Then another example is that accumulation of fluid in its extremes. This is an like definition of edema if you go and check the knowledge base of medical things. So 
he worked basically on these kind of things like naming these implicit entities and then exploiting these implicit entities in the text and then classifying the uh, documents on the basis of these things. In one corpus, he found 40% implicit entity and uh, hmm. uh, another 60%. And this is a, another good example where it is right in your plain sight and nobody is solving the problem. Nobody solved the this was the first work on implicit to my knowledge. Mm. And with, with such a high prevalence. Uh, I have a very basic question. So I was trying to understand why uh, when the work that we are doing is performing way better than whatever is currently existing, why hasn't this work made it to the mainstream adoption? Uh, we still have Spacey, which is a learned... Uh, Absolutely right. I, I don't know. If you can answer so, the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift. The paradigm shift. You're subject to a paradigm shift. See, what happens is that uh, when you... Um, it is very clear when you come up with LSTM or SVM or something, ethically, and a lot of people use it, that's very clear, the value and trend. When you define a conceptual problem that is not well solved, and um, all the other people can't solve it yet in the way they are going. They're going to ignore it. They're not going to decide. They're going to work on this. If they, uh, we showed it that this is a real problem. And here is a data set of books, database of uh, uh, movies, 40 percent, increased 60 percent inclusivity mentions, hand coded, data is published. People don't want to work on it because they are not able to. Very quickly, they still want to say the problem is not solved. Hmm? They still want to say no, the problem is not solved. It's 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 and even uh, I think another challenge is like uh, uh, people have proved their point, like okay, this is the problem and uh, uh, we can solve uh, by this method. But uh, if you see uh, the scalability point of view, it is difficult, right? So uh, maybe by creating uh, knowledge graph accurately from the definition it is also challenging like we need to have a difficulty or not if the problem is so prevalent <coughs> right one approach one solution i see is that when we say a uh, glue needs to be semantic here is our uh, uh, benchmark uh, uh, and uh, that includes you know implicit entity because uh, semantically we know what they mean mm -hmm. and so you include that and then you publish it and then say this is our result and uh, then you know let people try and you know compete with that so that is one way if we really, you know can um, we can we can really get attention of other people but anyway at it, some point of time um maybe they will uh, come across that uh, 20 years later sometimes it is not so you see my paper uh 50 years 15 years on semantic search right uh, not article Similarly, when I did the work on federal databases, that was late, uh, you know, that was 80s. The commercial product from IBM came uh, 15 years later. So very often there is a lag in finding a real problem and solution. Uh, you know, and of course the semantic and search was same. Some complications are not being uh, detected timely. Uh, that is also one thing which I understand. So fantastic, guys. Uh, I think there are five more to go. So I, no, just... I didn't complete it. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, but it is 2.29. Um, let's, uh, uh, if you have something quick. Yeah, I just discussed like why and what this was the how part, like how they did it. It's like implicit, extracted implicit information is by first of all, uh, knowledge acquisition then knowledge modeling, which was the entity modeling, entity indicator, like entity linking all these things, extracting all the entities, then detecting implicit information from the extracted entity. And this was the example in the medical domain, like they are using uh, clinical documents, which are semantically annotated for entities and using the CTEX, they are trying to identify the relationship populated from there and <laughs> And, and trying to like explain like what were the unexplained symptoms which were not directly written in the notes. 
then uh, information extraction was the entity linking part like positive or negative annotations in the word and all these things yeah deepa i think uh, maybe we can cover this part yeah. in the next slide yeah, we'll have to. This is Vin and our partner Franklin in Vietnam. We are the first trip. <laughs> we talked about Vin. Okay, guys. Who sets up hmm? on Thursday? Who, who sets up the connections? Who's gonna... No, I think uh, on first. Okay, first. so I'm going to have some videos that I want to have lined up. So I'd like to meet you at least 15 minutes early. Sure. Before class. Okay. I'm very excited. Please, please about that. So. We'll be not here. Yeah. I I, I'm very excited about your class. <laughs> 